Hello, everybody. My name is Greg Iverson. I'm the pastor of senior adults at the White Bear Lake campus of Eagle Brook Church. Thanks for joining us today for this online Bible study. You know, by far the, the biggest thing that I do in a normal work week is to teach a Bible study for senior adults at our church that we call Encompass. We call ourselves Encompass because we try to encompass all senior adults. Anyway, preparing for that Bible study and then teaching that Bible study uh, takes up just about all of my available hours. But of course, that's in a normal work week. And I don't have to tell you that hardly anything has been normal for me or for almost anybody now uh, for several months. And the thing is that it doesn't look like what's normal is going to return for quite a while yet, does it? I mean, much as we might all yearn for and, and pray for things to be the way they were even less than just three months ago, the fact of the matter is that it's going to be a while. It's going to be a couple of months at least before we can get together again as a church. And maybe even longer than that before some of us will feel safe getting together at the church given all of the health risks concerned. But God's people need to continue to study God's word, right? God's people need to stay immersed in his word, no matter what's going on in our world. You know, we are blessed, you and I, so exceedingly blessed to live at a time when we don't have to come together in each other's presence, each other's physical presence, in order to study God's word together. A time when we don't have to let outside circumstances dictate or determine whether or not we will stay engaged with what God said to his people a long time ago, uh, or what he wants to say to his people even today, to you and me, in and through the same book. We may be quarantined. We may be isolated physically, you and I, but we can still come together through technology, many of us anyway, to learn what God has to say to us as together we remain grounded in his word. You know, I have been teaching on Paul's letter to the Romans before all this took place. And I actually thought about just kind of continuing on with that study, just picking up where we had left off. But gang, this is an unusual time, is it not? And somehow it just didn't seem right to me to continue on with that study on the book of Romans as if nothing at all had happened, because in fact, something big has happened in our world. It seemed to me like we needed to study something, you and I, something in the Bible, that might help us get through this very unusual time. But folks, let's be honest about what's happening here, about what's going on here, what's going on in and to our world. This is not just an unusual time. This is a time, let me just say it like it is, this is a time of suffering. Suffering in different ways and to many different extents to be sure, but suffering still the same. It's inescapable. It hits all of us in some way. The greatest suffering, of course, has been among those who have had to deal with the physical effects of this pandemic, either at home or in hospitals. Some have died from this virus. And of course, the fact is that those families, the families of those who have gotten sick and died, have suffered along with their loved ones, a suffering made worse sometimes because they haven't even been allowed to be in the same room or even in the same building as their loved ones. Doctors and nurses and other medical personnel have suffered under seemingly endless hours of being on duty as they themselves have risked their lives tending to the sick and the dying. God bless them. Businesses have suffered as they've been closed and now perhaps reopened again to some extent, but only under certain restrictions, which means, of course, that our economy continues to suffer. Some of our own personal freedoms have suffered, as some of the places that we might have wanted to go have been closed, or we ourselves have decided, you know, it's just not worth the effort. I've got two cars sitting in my garage, both with full tanks of gas, because we're not going anywhere. Families have suffered as they have missed birthday parties like we did for our 11-year-old grandson last month. Weddings and funerals and graduations and vacations 
and family reunions have, have all had to be canceled or rescheduled. Employees have suffered as they've lost their jobs. People have suffered uh, great hits to their retirement programs. People have suffered great anxiety over what's happened in less than just three months. And some have suffered in still other ways. But the bottom line to all of this is that this is far more than just a temporary little inconvenience, isn't it? I mean, let's just say it like it is. This is a gut punch to our normal way of life. This is suffering on a mass scale, something unknown since the polio epidemic of the 1940s and 50s or going all the way back to the flu pandemic of 1918, over 100 years ago. This is suffering with no clear end in sight, ongoing suffering. It's more than just an unusual time. It's a time of suffering, huge suffering for many, many people. And as if all of this were not enough, and it certainly is, but if it weren't enough, even as I speak these words, significant suffering is taking place in many cities across our land right now in response to a police action in our own metropolitan area, the Twin Cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul in Minnesota. In a very real way, suffering has been piled on top of other suffering. And so gang, maybe you can understand as we have all had to suffer in various ways together lately. And as I have thought about doing an online Bible study at this particular time, maybe you can understand why I thought about a man in the Bible who himself suffered greatly and about the book in the Old Testament named after that man who suffered. Maybe you can understand why I thought about Job. You know, even if you've never read the book of Job, even if you only know a very little bit about Job as a man, you probably know that he knew suffering, suffering on a grand scale, suffering as much as anybody has ever suffered, except perhaps Jesus. As the story goes, I don't think I'm giving away any big secret here. I'm sure you know this. As the story goes, in a very short period of time, even before the end of the second chapter of a book that has 42 chapters, Job suffers losses, many losses, huge losses, unthinkable losses, not necessarily in the order of their importance, but pretty much in the order that they happen. Job, whom we are told was a very wealthy man, a man who had just about everything going for him. Job suffers the losses of all of his livestock, which was basically his livelihood, the loss of his servants who were all murdered, the loss of all of his sons and daughters who die when a house falls in on them. And then the loss of his health as he is covered from head to toe with painful sores. On top of all of that, he also loses his wife in a way as she abandons any kind of emotional support of her husband and urges him to simply deal with all of his losses by renouncing his faith, by cursing God, and then just allowing himself to roll over and die. And then before too long, he loses the respect of many of his friends and neighbors who suspect that Job must have done something bad, even though he maybe wasn't aware of it, but something very bad to have deserved all that happened to him. You know, when our children were small, uh, Rita and I used to read a book to them written by Judith Yorst called Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible no good, very bad day. Well, I don't want to make light in any way of Job's losses. But you know, I've been thinking that Job was having a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad few days, to put it mildly. In fact, he suffered so much that his name, Job, has been ever since then pretty, not, pretty much synonymous with suffering. Am I right? Folks, I can't help it, but when I think of the suffering of this present time, my thoughts automatically turn to Job, the man Job, and the book of Job. So what I'd like to do today, friends, in the time that I have left, is to look with you at just the first few verses of the first chapter of this book, 
And then over the next several weeks, I'd like to bite off anywhere between maybe just a few chapters at a time and maybe even several chapters a week as we work our way through this entire book. I don't want to predict right now uh, just exactly how long this is going to take or try to hold us to any kind of set schedule. I'd like to allow the spirit to break in on us if the spirit chooses to do that. But I think that it's fair to say that sometimes we'll go slow and sometimes we'll go fast. Uh, that sometimes we'll spend quite a bit of time on a single verse and then sometimes we'll jump over certain verses or maybe even over entire chapters. Sometimes we'll use a microscope to, to zero in on, and look at things up close. And then sometimes we use a telescope to, to pull back and look at things in much broader range. And you know, I, I really feel like I should warn you. I really do need to warn you that, that uh, there may be times in this study, uh, frankly, when it's going to be hard for you to read what I've asked you to read. Uh, just like uh, it may be hard for me sometimes to teach on it. Because Job's suffering may bring some of our own personal suffering at this particular time closer to the surface. But what I want to say to you is that's okay. You know, that, that's really okay. The reason that I chose this study on the book of Job is so that we might all get a better perspective, you and I, on our own personal suffering, our own suffering right now. In fact, I wonder if I can say to you right now as we begin this study to allow yourself to feel Job's pain as you get in touch perhaps with your own pain. If you do that, if we all do that, I believe that this study, without necessarily being an easy one for any of us, will nonetheless bless your life. At least that's my prayer. I want to let you know up front, by the way, that I'm using the new international version of the Bible, or the NIV, uh, for this study, because I think that the NIV, um, that particular version, combines good evangelical scholarship with good readability. It might be easier for you if you have that version to follow along with me as we look at those verses and chapters. But please feel free to use any version of the Bible that works for you, any version at all. Whatever version you're using, please open it up, if you will, now to the book of Job, which comes just before the book of Psalms. You know, gang, the book of Job is a very old book. Some Bible scholars believe, in fact, that the book of Job may be the oldest book in the entire Bible, going back to the 11th or 12th century BC, or even further back than that. And if you look closely, you'll see that much of the book of Job, most of it actually, is written in verses or stanzas, which means that Job is largely a book of poetry, Hebrew poetry, which makes it like the Psalms, the Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Solomon. There are, as you probably know, a number of different kinds of literature in the Bible. There are laws and rules, history, wisdom, gospels, letters, narratives, poetry, and maybe one or two other kinds of literature, all in addition to poetry. And since Job is poetry, you really have to read it like poetry as an old very old poetic book. We really don't know who wrote the book of Job. Some scholars say that it was written by the main character of this book, a man named Job, which makes it his autobiography, I guess. Other scholars say that, well, maybe Moses wrote it, or maybe Solomon wrote it, like he wrote Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and the Song of Solomon. Or that maybe Elihu, a character who appears late in the book of Job, maybe Elihu wrote it. But of course, that's all speculation. The fact of the matter is that we really don't know for sure who wrote this book. If you look at the very first verse of the first chapter, you'll find that this story takes place in what is called the land of Uz, spelled U-Z, which was a real geographical day, uh, place in present-day Jordan and Syria, between the city of Damascus and the Euphrates River. By the way, when, when the book, The Wizard of Oz, a book that was written in 1900 by Frank Baum, when that book was written, 
and then shortly thereafter translated into Hebrew over in Israel. They called it the Wizard of Uz. True story for you to amaze and impress your friends. But don't you get confused. The story of Job takes place in the land of Uz. And if you look at the rest of this very first verse, you'll get a pretty good idea about the main character of this story. I'm not going to read it for you now, word for word, but follow along, please, as I sort of paraphrase what's there. What you'll see here in these first three verses is that this is a story about a man named Job who lived in an area, as we've already noted, called Uz. And the main thing to be learned about this man named Job, listen, is that he was blameless and upright. That he, that he feared God, which meant that he dearly loved and worshipped God and was completely devoted to God, and that he shunned evil. In other words, friends, we are given a picture here of a very good and faithfully devout Hebrew man. The word blameless here in this first verse, this very first verse, pretty much says it all. It basically tells us everything that we need to know about the character of this man named Job. The next couple of verses, chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, fill in some more of the blanks about Job's life, in which we are told that uh, he had seven sons and three daughters, nice big family, and listen, thousands of sheep and camels and hundreds each of oxen and donkeys and a whole lot of servants. You know, when I read... <laughs> When I read those words, I, I wondered how the servants must have felt if they had known that all the animals were mentioned before them. But actually, this is not uh, at all about the servants. This is a book about Job. And what we are told is that he was a good man, a faithful man, a blameless man, a procreative man, for sure, a wealthy livestock owner, and therefore, of course, a big landowner. I mean, you've got to have a good-sized chunk of property to graze 11,000 animals, I'm thinking. And he was, we are told, basically, to sum it all up, the greatest man among all the people of the East. In other words, to put it bluntly, Job was the man. But what you need to know, gang, is that all of these things that we might call possessions or gifts, you know, a whole bunch of kids, thousands of animals, a lot of servants, things that we might call possessions or gifts were all signs back then, back when the book of Job was written, that God, that, that Job himself was greatly blessed by God. And that you might even say greatly favored by God. We don't necessarily see things that way uh, ourselves, of course, do we? For example, just by way of comparison, Rita and I have two grown children, zero animals and zero servants. And we feel very blessed. Blessed actually to not have any more than that. I mean, I wouldn't take a million dollars for either of our two children. But at my age, I wouldn't give you a nickel for another one. Things were different back then. Back then, back in Old Testament times, especially back in early Old Testament times, the more you had, the more children you had, the more property you had, the more money you had, the more servants you had, the more of anything you had, the more it was a sign that you had been hugely blessed, especially blessed by God. Job, in other words, there really is no other way to say it. Job was one of God's very best all-time favorites as far as the writer of this book was concerned. The next couple of verses tell us even more about the character of this man called Job. Look at those verses with me, if you will, please. You know, it looks like Job had his hands full with his 10 kids. I say that because it looks like most of them, the sons at least, were adult children because we are told that they all had their own homes. And like a lot of young adults, they apparently like to, well, let's just say they like to party. They like to party hardy. The book of Job tells us, in fact, that the seven sons each took turns holding big feasts at their homes for all of their brothers and their sisters. 
And you know, I may be reading between the lines a, a little bit here, but I'm thinking that there may have been some wives and maybe some husbands and maybe some boyfriends and some girlfriends and maybe some other friends also at those parties. I mean, what kind of party can you have with just the brothers and sisters? Um, all those rich people, all those rich kids eating and drinking in their own homes, mom and dad way down the road, nowhere to be seen, the wine flowing freely, I think that Job probably had his hands full with his adult children. But if he did, he didn't just throw up his hands and say, oh, well, kids will be kids. No, the next morning after a big party, look at what it says. The morning after every party, apparently Job was on the scene. The book of Job tells us to have his children purified which meant that Job sacrificed one of his animals, not for all 10 of his children together, but one animal for each of his children. Perhaps he said to himself, my children have sinned. I'm thinking they probably did. And maybe even cursed God at last night's wild party. So Job went to God on their behalf, and he did it regularly. He didn't just have children. He didn't just make children. He loved his children, and he did everything possible to be a good father to them. He was a rich man, which meant probably that his kids were rich. But he was concerned for their spiritual welfare. He wanted his children to be pure before God. Job's life wasn't perfect, of course. Nobody's perfect. But we are told that he was blameless, which I'm thinking is per near perfect. At the very least, he was a good man, a moral man, a God-fearing man, a great man, a loving father. Of course, we know how the story goes, don't we? I mean, I've already told you how things come crashing down on Job, how he loses virtually everything. And we'll look at all of that next week. But for today, I want you to think just about the basic goodness of this man named Job. Friends, I've I posted a study guide for this morning's lesson on our Facebook and Compass page with some questions for you to consider. If you haven't already looked at that guide, I encourage you to look at it when I finish here in just a minute or two. And maybe, you know, if you're watching this lesson along with somebody else, a spouse, maybe, or somebody who lives with you, maybe you can discuss with that other person how you would answer the questions that I've written down for you. Or maybe you can call somebody you know in Encompass and discuss the questions with them. After those questions, I've written a short prayer that you can pray either silently or out loud, whatever works best for you. And then at the very bottom of the page, I've given you an assignment in case you want to read ahead for next week's lesson. I'm going to try to get a discussion guide on our Facebook page each week before each lesson so you can have it ahead of time. You know, gang, if you could just leave a, a comment uh, on our Facebook page to let us know that you saw this lesson, along with any suggestions you might have, that would really be helpful to us. I look forward to being with you next week. Let's pray. Father, we are so glad that you are an omniscient, all-knowing God. We don't have to tell you, Lord, that we are hurting. We don't have to come up with just the right words, with the proper prayer language to express to you the depth of our pain when we are in pain. You know that pain already. Your Holy Spirit not only knows how we feel, but conveys to you, as your Apostle Paul wrote to the Romans, in groans too deep for words, the pain that we do feel. And so we come to you now humbly and almost wordless to ask, Lord, that you hear the cries of our land and our world and our own individual cries as we go through these tough times together to the extent that we think or say or do things that bring on our own suffering or the suffering of others, forgive us. 
and teach us how to be better than we have been. To the extent that we have been given more than others, help us to share. To the extent that we can be used, despite all of our imperfections, to bind up the wounds of those who are hurting, use us. As we have done before, but need to do again and again, we put our lives into your hands, Lord, for you to use us as you will in any and all circumstances. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. See you next week, everybody.